I'm having a great day so far. Thank you very much for having me in Taiwan. This is a fantastic place. It's my first time visiting, and it's uh, been a real pleasure so far. I went to a lot of camera stores. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome. This is going to be a slightly different talk than I usually do. Um, normally, I give talks about some technical and design decisions, and today I'm going to get into something a little more personal to all of us, uh, language itself. So if you'd like, you can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Kenneth Wrights. I tweet about a lot of things. And if, I also work for Heroku. Heroku is a really great company for web, deploying web applications written in many different languages. Um, Python is the one that I work on, and I think it's the best place to host Python applications. But if you do Ruby or Node.js or anything else, you can use us for that. And uh, if you'd like to learn more, you can come talk to me afterwards. I'm also a member of the Python Software Foundation, which exists to help um, secure, secure the future of the Python programming language. And based on the fact that we're here, I assume everybody here is interested in the future of Python. So we've changed our membership uh, a little bit. In the past, if you wanted to become a member, you had to get voted in, and it was this big bureaucratic process where people had to, you know, you had to like know someone and you had to get in. And now, um, we st now there's a open sign up. So if you want to become a member of the PSF, you just go to the website and you sign up, and you can participate in the conversations and get involved in the different activity groups. And uh, I highly recommend doing that because it's really important. So if you know who I am or what I do, it's probably from the open source projects that I've written. Um, if you go to my GitHub profile at github.com slash kennethwrites, you'll see about 18 serious projects and a bunch of little experiments, um, the two most popular of which are called OSX GCC Installer, which allows you to install Xcode on your Mac without using, or GCC on your Mac without installing Xcode, and Requests, which is a very pi popular Python language or framework for uh, making HTTP requests. Um, in addition to code, I do a lot of other things. I like photography, synthesizer, travel, and I speak at a lot of events. But enough about me. I'm going to talk about you. Um, so Python is a programming language, right? But in addition to being just a programming language, it is also a language, first and foremost. And we're going to talk a little bit about what language itself is, what it is that we do as humans, and how the future of Python affects the future of all humanity. Be pretty cool. So there's a lot of different ways to um, view the way we experience life here as humans. But if we're going to go back in history a little bit and kind of like look at what mainstream science believes uh, has been the case. Um, so you have like really early humans. This is like from the Paleolithic era, um, before we really learned how to verbally communicate with each other. Um, you just kind of had yourself alone with your ideas. You know, you could you had a group of people that you could interact with, but there was no spoken language. So if you look at a lot of animals today, uh, this is how they communicate most of the time. And so, like in your little world, as a human in this world, you have. You know, you're just kind of alone and by yourself with your ideas. Then over time, we developed this thing called spoken language, which allowed us to start communicating not only with ourselves, but with other people and express our ideas. This obviously changes the way things work, and it's been pretty great. And then over time, we learned how to write our language down, which allows you to persist your ideas over time. And uh, as far as we know, we're the only uh, um, animals that can do this, and it's helped us quite a bit. So if you look over the years, the, really the human hardware that we have hasn't really changed at all, um, but the software has been upgraded. We're born, and you know, we learn from our parents. We download the software that our parents built for us and that their generation built for us, and then it, we install it and we upgrade it ourselves, and that's what we're doing every day in our lives. And so, you know, and the brain chemistry hasn't necessarily changed at all in this time. So it's very powerful what software can do. So at first, when we learned how to communicate, we had something called one-to-one -one communication. And this is what most of the conversations you have on a daily basis um, comprise of. So basically, this means that a, uh, you know, you're, you're having a conversation with your friend, and that's it. You're just going back and forth, one-to-one. 
Um, so this is used for a single person to communicate to another single person or a small group of people. And at, when, this, when we first learned how to have spoken language, this was the only way we knew how to communicate. But due to technology advances, this is no longer the case. So this is really cool here. This is one of the first written languages that we know of um, from thousands of years ago. And this was a letter sent from a prince to somebody else about someone who had died. And you know, someone carried this, they chiseled this idea into a piece of stone and they carried it across the country and to give it to somebody else and that message was communicated. I think this is really remarkable and if you look at how, you know, to me I look at this and it means nothing but to someone this meant something and this is a good representation of what humans do. This is what we do. You know, there's a lot of different animals that have a primary function that do certain things and what we do is we record information and we interact with information. So after we developed one-to-one -one communication, we uh, learned how to do this thing called one-to-many, and this is very important. So there's this, there was the development of the printing press, which allows one single privileged person to you know, publish a book or an idea to thousands, if not millions of people. And this takes many different forms. You have the printing press, you have newspapers, books, television, and radio. And when you have this different way of communicating, um, you start having this idea in your head of the public, which is basically like, you know, in addition to me and my concerns that I have in my world, I know what everyone else is worried about as well. And that really changes the way we think about problems. And it's very polarizing. So after one-to-many, uh, one we develop something called many-to-many -many communication. Does anybody want to guess what many-to-many -many communication is? What form it takes today? Anybody at all? Huh? Meetings. Meetings. Is that what you said? No. Oh. It's the internet. <laughs> Meetings? Yeah. Well, a little bit. The internet is many-to-many -many communication. Basically, if you have access to the internet, you have access to a universe of information and ideas. And if you look at the way humans have evolved over the years, this is the exact thing that we've been optimizing for all this time. We've been trying to make it so it's easier to communicate with each other. And today, because of the internet, anyone can communicate with anyone else that has access to that system. And this completely blows the doors off of everything we were trying to accomplish. You know, and basically, anybody in the world who has access to the internet can publish anything to a number of people, large or small, and it makes this a very level, plain field, ideally. Um, the implications of this are really huge. So before, you know, you just had yourself, and then we learned how to communicate with other people, and we learned how to take our ideas and, and burn them into time. Now we're also able to do that with space. You know, I'm here in Taiwan, and I've never been here before, and it's thousands of miles from my home, but I've been talking to people that live here on a daily basis because of the internet. This has never been possible before, and it's really exciting that we're here today and that we're able to do this, and as software engineers, it's really important for us as well because we are the ones that are building the tools that people are using to communicate. So we have a very important role in the world. So as you go along these different axes of what we're, you know, what, how we can explore the world, um, you know, you can like go on the internet and you can use the internet to find all kinds of things about yourself. You can learn about self-expression, self-identity, culture, and history. You know, all the information in the world ideally, is available. And there's different tools that are available online, things that are built by software developers, built by the people in this room, that allow you to create and publish, consume and discover different things. Uh, you have social media, and you have research and information. Diff you know, th these are things that we've always wanted as humans, and that we have now, and it's really exciting. So this is the first time in human history we have the technology. There's nothing stopping us. So there's no excuse for you not to, to go do your thing. So the question is, how does this relate to Python, right? To me, Python is very special. Can I get a show of hands? Show, raise your hand if you use Python on a daily basis. Hopefully everybody here. Raise them high, I need to see them. OK, now, well, we'll do that in a bit. All right. So Python's a really beautiful language. If you look at all the other programming languages that are around that are popular, Python's a little bit different than all the rest of them. Um, so if you go into a Python interpreter and type in import this, you have what is called the Zen of Python. And this is a set of 20 phrases that kind of represent what Python means 
to everyone in this room. And it's pretty beautiful. We have things that are like beautiful is better than ugly. Explicit is better than implicit. Simple is better than complex. And complex is better than complicated. These are philosophies that the Python ecosystem, community, and the language itself are all kind of built around. And that's what really sets Python apart. I wouldn't want to be spending my days writing Ruby or PHP or anything else. I really like those languages, and they're good for certain things. But for me, I get a real joy from writing things in Python. And so to me, if you look at you know, the way language has evolved over the years and taking all these different forms. If, so if the software that we're building is making it possible for humans to communicate in a way they never have before, and these things are built using programming languages, then I think that the one that's important to me, Python, is very important. I think that it has a very significant role in the entire world and that we should do everything we can to preserve its future. Because I love Python. I love it a lot. But I'm really kind of afraid right now for the future of Python. I'm, I'm actually pretty terrified. Because Python, this beautiful expression of everything that I care and love about in the world and this group of people that are you know, my family, is, is doing pretty good. But at the same time, it might not be. Because Python right now is split into two. You have Python 2 and you have Python 3. So we, said we had a show of hands earlier to see everyone who uses Python. So let's do a show of hands. Show, raise your hand if you use Python 2 on a daily basis. I'm going to take another picture. OK, and get, take a look around so you can see, you know, so you get a good feel for how many people that was. That was almost everybody. Uh, now raise your hand if you use Python 3 on a daily basis. It's getting pretty good, but statistically, Quite a few. <laughs> There's two hands in the back. Nice. All right, let me take another picture. Sorry. One more time. This is a boundary that divides and separates the Python community. And there's a lot of different reasons for it. So, you know, Python 3 is a new language, effectively. It's not the same as Python. Python 2 and Python 3 are, they come from the same family, but they're a little different, which is why we haven't adopted it so quickly. And it's understandable. It's OK to be afraid of Python 3, right? Like, Python 3 is a little different. It's a little weird. And you're not alone in feeling that either. So if you look at Python 3, like, it's, it's effectively a completely different language in many ways. Some of the things that we you know, use most often have been completely changed. Um, so if you take like a byte string, uh, like we have at the top here with the B in front of it, and you do a, uh, if you slice it, you get back an integer. It's a little odd, not really used to that. It's not very familiar to me. That's not the Python I know and love. Um, if you cast uh, a byte string to a string, uh, you kind of get some weird behavior. It's a little bit of a bug, but you know, it's definitely a bug. <laughs> um, and you know, there's just a lot of weird things. Like if you pass an integer to, to bytes, it just like gives you a set of bytes. Like it just multiplies it out, and it's, you know, it's like not a big deal. But like if these are the things that you're building every piece of software with, you know, you want it to be really nice. When I use Python 2 and I use stuff like this, I was always really inspired because it was really great, and like it always did exactly what I expected. Or if it didn't, I was really excited because it taught me something. Python 3 does that too, but it's a little different, right? Like. If you're looking at this byte string and you're slicing it and you get an integer back, you're going to learn a lot about the way bytes work. Um, but you know, from an ergonomic perspective, it's not. It's okay to be afraid of that. It's different. There's a lot of complaints in the Python community um, for the way things work now. Now everything is Unicode by default. And uh, if you know Armin Ronaker, the creator of Flask, he uh, <laughs> he gets very angry about the new Unicode setup because you know he. There's a lot of ways, you know, there's, there's corner cases, extreme cases when it won't function properly with like file paths and stuff like that. Um, and codecs and all this stuff, like there, it, there's reasons why it hasn't been adopted so quickly. Um, the standard library has also been broken for a really long time. Uh, if you, like if you look at Python 3.2, uh, a lot of the, the code that was shipped for the URL, URL modules, like that requests use, um, they had very, they documented how they function, but then you go to use them and they would have different behavior. And, you know, this actually, and this, you know, this was shipped out and it was the way it works. 
And it, it, most of those bugs have been fixed now. There's still, you know, bugs here and there, and they're all publicly tracked. But, you know, this is, a, this is a, one of the reasons it hasn't been adopted so quickly. And the reason for this is because there really haven't been that many users of Python 3, and this exacerbates the problem. But, you know, the default way of looking at this is, well, of course there are users, right? Everyone's using Python 3 except for me, right? <laughs> so we, we can look at the data. There's data now to, to see who's using Python 2 and who's using Python 3. We, we started off with a little bit of data, just the sampling in this room. You know, we're a group of people that love Python enough to like pay and come to be at a Python conference, right? What about all the other people who use Python just at their job? Data's pretty great. So if you look at the cheese shop, which is the Python package index, which is where if you ever run easy install or pip, all of your packages get downloaded from, um, I think that we can use this as a canonically accepted source for all Python package downloads. Basically, if you are using Python, you are using pip. That's a claim that I'm making in this moment. And, um, and so it, last year sometime, pip made a change where uh, it sends the version. When you make a request to the server, it's, it tells the server what version of Python you're running. And like if you're using Windows or Linux, and so using that data, we've able, we're able to like take a look and get some really great uh, information out of it about the future of Python and the current state and where we want to go. So I have some data from the cheese shop from, uh, Janu from January of 2014, last year. Um, Donald Stuffed is a really great guy who works on all the packaging infrastructure, and he provided this data for me. So if you look at all the downloads of all packages in the time slot, uh, 81 million packages were downloaded using Python 2, and only 3 million were downloaded with Python 3. That's a lot worse than I expected. Not too good. And this is a really great graph, also provided by Donald. Um, this is of about January to September of last year. Uh, all the different, this is the distribution of all the different Python versions downloading packages from the cheese shop. If you look at that really pink line at the very top, those are the unknown ones. So those, we don't know what the version is, so you can ignore that. Uh, this giant orangish one here in the middle is Python 2.7, right? That's the thing that everyone uses. You look below it, and you have 2.6. Those are for people that are like, using old versions of Ubuntu and haven't updated yet. Uh, and if you look at the very, very top, you see this little green line and this little red line? Those are Python 3. <laughs> but it's getting bigger, so it's good. <laughs> So this is a really interesting thing. The more you dive into this problem, um, the more you'll notice that there's some interesting trends that start to occur. If you go onto like Reddit or Hacker News, um, you'll have there's a like if, if there's a blog post that's been shared about Python 2, then you'll have all these people getting really angry. You know, and they'll be like, why isn't this uh, why isn't this talking about Python 3? And it's really interesting, because I go to all the Python conferences, and I talk to all the developers, and I never know, meet many people at all that use 3. And I most certainly don't meet people that would be angry that a blog post uses Python 2. And so I had to dig into this for a while to figure out what was going on. And what happens is uh, there's new people who are coming to the programming language. You know, If you're a new developer, and you're learning Python for the first time, then I know for me, that was when I spent all of my time on Hacker News and on Reddit, and I was commenting, and I was excited, and, you know, and I had opinions that was starting to form. And it's really interesting, because there's a big group of these people on the internet who are very defensive of three, and it's great, because you know, they're building their own community. Like, there's this separate community from the one I'm a part of, it feels like. To me, it feels like there's the Python 2 community, and then there's this newer Python 3 community. And that's what concerns me is that you know, I don't want those to be two separate communities. And in theory, they aren't. But it feels like that right now. Two and three are also divided in a couple other ways. Um, if you look at the way Python, the Python community used to receive peps and different things that were being, you know, so let's say there was a new pep that introduced a new change to the language. People get really excited. They start talking about it. Everyone had opinions. They couldn't wait to download the new version to try out this stuff. Um, but nowadays, it's not really that way. There's a lot of peps, and there's people that are interested in them, but it doesn't have the same like 
velocity that it used to have. And what I've observed is that the core developers have been really isolated from the Python community, and the Python community has been more isolated from the core developers because most of the community is using Python 2.7. So you know, if everyone's using 2.7 and all of the work that the core developers are doing is on 3, you know, then the core developers are working on new features, they're asking for feedback, they're writing peps, they're doing the same thing they've always done, but the Python community isn't, you know, is, isn't as interested as it used to be, and this really kind of separates us. Um, and so this is a kind of a duality in the way that we're doing things right now. Library maintainers have to double their efforts to support both Python 2 and Python 3 at the same time. All of my libraries, they, they work on both at the same time, and it takes a lot of work to do that. Once you do it, it's okay, but you know, it's a lot of effort that has to be put in. Um, core maintainers will continue working in a vacuum, which, which further separates and divides the community. Um, the core maintainers want feedback. They want people involved. They want people to be excited about the things they're working on, but if you're not using 3, you're not interested in what they're working on. And new users will keep coming to Python 3, and Python 2, the, that community may slowly attrude away into nothing. So, you are the problem. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're the problem. Come on. I know there's more of you. I'm going to take another picture. Oh, all right. You are the problem, but thankfully, you are also the solution. These two different communities, these things that feel like two different things to me, are actually the same thing. And I think that what we should do is look within ourselves uh, before the Python that we know and love is only a memory. I don't want these to be two separate communities. I want it to be one community. I want there to be one Python. I want there to be one and only one obvious way to do it. <laughs> so stop waiting for the right blog post or conference talk to influence your opinion. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, Python 3, I'll try it out once like, it's obvious that I should be using it, right? You have to, like, and then you like, wait for Armin or some guy to write this blog post convincing you to or to not use it. No, that ends right now. <laughs> You need to have a direct experience, and you need to have it right now. So have a direct experience. Share it with us. Go and download Python 3. Try to use it. Have some opinions. If you have opinions, write about them. Share, share them with us so we can all learn. You know, there's some, this is something that's being continually worked on, and if, if no one is using it because they're not interested, then uh, you know, we're losing all that involvement. It's not good. So that's talk, but I'm just going to go off the rails for a second. When I wrote this, I was originally uh, didn't really want to take a side. I wanted to make it so everyone would kind of take away what they wanted to. So some people feel like I'm pushing for people to use two. Some people feel like I'm pushing for people to use three. And that was the case. But I think after talking to lots of people about this, I think that we should all just start using three. <laughs> And so you can definitely take away from this talk that, you know, you could use 2.7 for the rest of your life and be very happy. I know I would be. <laughs> but to me, the Python community itself is much more important than the tool I'm using. It's about the people and the things that are built out of it. And I'm really excited about that. And so to me, I think that, you know, it's, we just need to swallow that really disgusting medicine that is Python 3 and just let it flow through us. And um, then we can all be a, one community again and move on and it'll be really great. So that's my advice. And that's the end of my talk. So anybody have any questions? Cool. Hello. Yes. Hello. There's always a question when you change, will it change again? Will it change again? Well, so hopefully. why should we change if, we, if it may change again? Well, the change in, from Python 2 to Python 3 was a very large change. And I don't think that that will ever happen again, something that large. But who knows? <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that it'll ever be this painful again. No, I think this is the, the big one, if you will. <laughs> uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Hello. And uh, um, currently, we use the Python 2 because the Python 3 doesn't support all the function that exists on two, mm -hmm. so we, we um, basically we can't use Python three for our works. 
Yeah. And so is this for longer. packages that you yeah, need support for? for? Yeah, th those packages. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's that was a common problem. Luckily, I I, I focus mostly on Python web stuff, and about two years ago, that was the case where a lot of packages didn't work in Python three. But the more and more support was added, it became the default. And now everyone supports Python 3 most of the time. And it's rare that you'll have a problem. So I'm really glad that I'm at that spot in my community. Um, and I think that I see, like, if you look at the scientific Python community, they're starting to adopt 3. There's been a lot of talk about that in the Anaconda world. Um, so there's definitely things moving forward. But like, it all has to happen. <laughs> like, like, if it's not happening now, then I would recommend, in, you know, in your part of the community, I would recommend, um, you know, that, like open a ticket on that package and be like, hey, there's no Python 3 support. Like sometimes that's all it takes. Like you have to, like if you're a maintainer, often if like someone wants Python 3 support, I'm not going to go and do all that work until someone asks for it, <laughs> you know? And uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's all, it's a very two-way street. You know, we have to just communicate and just be like, hey, I can't, you know, I'm at, I work for a company, we're using two because I can't use this package. And so that maybe that'll incentivize that person or someone else to port it, or yourself. <laughs> no, no, anyway, all right, thank you. Hi, uh, I came from um, Pro. Pro has like a, also similar things from Pro 5 and Pro 6. And then I come to the Python world, and uh, um, my coworker asked me, saying, "Give me some show hand." It's just say, "Go Python two, not Python three, because all those things are not compatible with Python 3. I just wonder that why is not like uh, just like uh, I know like um, .NET framework or something is like a uh, backward compatible. Just you know, if uh, Python 3 just, um, you know, have like an attribute saying that uh, it's backward compatible um, or something, enable the Python 2 binaries or whatever in back end and just make things happen, then people will willing to move forward to the Python 3, right? But if it doesn't, then by default they want, the language is just an interface for, for communicate with computers, right? So if it makes this, you know, difficult for programmers, then they will, you know, get trouble, right? So it's like a looking for win-win kind of solution. <laughs> if it's able to backward compatible, say yes, then work, my my code work or something. <laughs> that's that's totally great for us. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot first for uh, this talk and for request, which is an amazing library. You're welcome. Um, my question is the the data set you used for your graph was from the two first weeks of 2014. Yes. Did you look at more recent data? Yeah. Because that was 18 months ago. The graph that was uh, th that was shown after that that was a separate set of oh, data okay. from a much more recent. But if you go to Donald Stuffed, um, his domain is caremad.io. He has started to make these number, this data set available to everybody else to look at as well. Um, and so he's writing really detailed blog posts about all the different versions, and he's doing it on a monthly basis. And uh, the thing I f forgot to mention was that it's, if you look at, so I work at Heroku, where we deploy a lot of Python applications. And um, Jacob Kaplan-Moss did a really great presentation for the Python Language Summit this year, uh, where he kind of shared some of our Python numbers. And it was really interesting because at the time of PyCon US, which was about two months ago, 10% um, of the deploys done on Heroku were Python 3. And before that, um, it was like less than 1%. And if you look at the PyPy numbers as well, it's actually going up right now. And it's really exciting. And the reason for this that I can deduct, I can't figure out, like, there's a big spike all across the board. and. Uh, the only thing that appears to have changed is that Django made their uh, whole tutorial Python 3 by default. And that seems to have a tremendous impact on people. So I'm really excited about that. I don't think that this is like an insurmountable problem. I just think we need more time and for you know, little things like that to keep happening. So um, I'm probably going to start making all of my documentation being Python 3. Uh, I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, I recommend you do the same. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, uh, 
on one of your slides, you talk about one too many. That's when the notion of public is uh, constructed. So in the internet age, if it's many to many, does it imply that the notion of public would be would start a collapse or something? Hmm. I would say yes, but in, also on the internet, there also is one to many as well. So it's a blend of both of those things. But I definitely think that technology in general spreads towards interconnectedness, which is more and more like many to many. And as that happens, I feel like the, um, what's the right way to say this? You know, the structure that is in place that enforces one to many starts to become more optional and less significant, which makes uh, the you know, world a better place. If you, you know, you look at like BitTorrent and things like that, these are unstoppable things that kind of blow the doors off of, you know, one to many as the only option. So, and the internet just kind of, BitTorrent's one example, there's thousands and thousands of them. You have Bitcoins and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And so, I'm excited about what the future holds. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Just one quick comment. The plan is for Ubuntu and Red Hat to both change to Python 3 by default in the next major, in the next long-term support release. Very cool. That's going to be great. Awesome. Did you hear that? <laughs> cool. <laughs> I just have a short question for you. Uh, you spoke about the we being the problem as a community and also we being the solution. Uh, I have a, a very small question for you, and it might be personal to you too. Uh, how do we stop a Python 4? How do we start a Python? How do we stop a Python 4? Oh, I see. So how do we stop this from happening again? Yeah. Um, <laughs> getting more involved with the political structures that determine the future of the Python programming language. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I want to follow up that question, how to get that political uh, influence to, from that, uh, to, to prevent that from happening again. I mean, how, are we, uh, how would you suggest the local community to get involved yeah. into this? Well, so for me, I think what happens is, well, so Python 3 was a really special case, right? It was like someone is like, we're going to work on this thing and kind of on the side and then present it to the world once we know what it is. And it was called Python 3000. It was kind of weird. People didn't know what it was. And then like over time, it becomes the default version and everyone's still using 2. And there was this big, you know, kind of confusion around that. And I think that uh, that, you know, no one who's involved in Python in building these things is obviously intending for that to be the case. Uh, for me, this is kind of like a marketing problem where, or it's like, you know, Python can be treated as like a hobby project or as like a software product that, you know, has users and that we want to optimize for certain things. Um, so to me, I think that just, you know, if you have opinions on, you know, confusion around Python 3 in the moment to share them and to document them, write a blog post. And I think that, you know, people really listen to those things. And I think that would really help prevent that uh, in the future. And also, you know, just, you know, having more people involved actually really helps a lot. And you can be involved by writing a blog post. You can be involved by coming to this conference. You can be involved by writing C code. You know, there's any level of involvement that helps. And so I think that for me, I think it's just sharing, you know, where you're coming from and any concerns you have uh, with the community. So does that mean that you would suggest uh, the audience to get involved in the C, co uh, C Python core development? Well, if, if you feel that too, yes, but no, that's not what I mean. What I mean is uh, I think that if you have concerns about the way Python is, then you should share those things with the people that do it. And uh, you can do that in a blog post, you can join the mailing lists, or you can talk to them at events, you know. Um, and those things really go a long way. Do you have any idea about which, which group of Python use use which version, for instance, uh, web developer use which version, and uh, uh, test mining user use which, and uh, Graph interface user use which, or uh, mathematic chart maker use which version for, in, or or even there's no rule about the the question. Thank you. Are you are you asking which communities are are using which versions? Yes. 
So um, from what we can tell, Python 3 is being adopted 4% faster by the web community than the rest of the language, uh, which is really interesting to me. Um, that's the only data I have. <laughs> But luckily, uh, and you know, this is determined by, if you just look at the style of packages that are being downloaded, like if you look at Django and Flask, um, and all those different dependencies, then you can kind of determine, you can kind of correlate some data, speculative data out of that. Um, but all this data is public now, so you can go and do that. I would recommend doing that if there's a specific community that you're interested in optimizing. All right, any, anyone else? <laughs> oh, yes, uh, because I have a personal question I want to ask. Yeah, as a package developer, uh, I, I feel that uh, I've been developing for Python 3 for quite some time now, and I always try to, because of the user base problem, I just try to develop for Python 3 first and port it back to Python 2. But the problem is that Python 3 has so many wonderful like new features, like Pathlib or uh, enum or something like those things that is n are not available on Python 2. So a lot of times I, I feel I, I'm writing Python 3, but I, I'm writing Python 3 code in Python 2 or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're writing a subset of, yeah. of Python. Yes, so are there, uh, are, are there some recommended ways as package developers to like leverage against new features in Python 3? Um, so a lot of the features get backported to Python 2, and you can install them, um, which is great. Um, but there's also some packages available. Uh, one is called, you know, there's 2 to 3, which comes with Python. There's also one called 3 to 2, which allows you to write your code in 3 and then convert it to Python 2 code. Um, but that won't do things like support async I.O. and all these new features. Um, and so I think, honestly, the best way to to use those features is to use them and then encourage the rest of the community to also use them. And then we'll all be able, you know, because async IO is really cool and all these other things that have been added to three, but I don't, I'm not using them and none of my friends are using them uh, because we're all using two. So, uh, you know, if we all start using three, then I think our, our whole world will get a lot better and it'll be exciting. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Are there any questions? No. Yeah, then uh, we thank, thanks for Kenneth for the wonderful talk and all the questions that we take. That, uh, so thank you very much, and this is some souvenir we want to give you. <laughs> thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Very